Uh, good morning, friends. Welcome to uh, OBE Journal 32, I believe. And um, I think uh, what I'm accessing as I meditate here um, before turning on the camera is a night of uh, many, many brief visits. And uh, perhaps uh, just uh, indicative of what you can do if you so wish. And... Uh, you know, a, a sort of a speed deficiency uh, <laughs> thing, or maybe just, you know, spinning around and having fun. Um, because, you know, uh, one can easily get caught up in the, uh, the, uh, hmm, the labyrinths of mystical philosophy or the, uh, the teachings of, uh, the uh, great souls um, and they're all very worthy of course but there's uh, there's times when uh, uh, the uh, putting aside of the uh, the planet's uh, uh, burdens of uh, evolution and uh, the small ways in which we as individual souls can contribute to that evolution um, can be put aside for, uh, you know, for more fun. And uh, it, it probably struck me as I was uh, planning this out uh, last night that uh, that would be a good thing to do. Um, because uh, the fate of the world can wait while we... Uh, <laughs> And uh, when I fade, I don't, when I say fade, I don't mean anything ominous. I just mean the uh, the ponderously slow evolution of uh, uh, spiritualizing matter, as I said in one of the uh, other uh, episodes. It uh, it's happening and it's not reversing, but it is it is slow, and one can. Uh, easily get very caught up in it in the all too serious uh, uh, applications of uh, you know um, spiritual ambition and uh, there's always time for fun and socializing so um, I uh, kind of sped out of my body fairly quickly and um, this would be about three hours ago so now it's it's dawn now. I uh, and went uh, without uh, much premeditation to visit my uh, sister who passed on from a, an illness. Oh, at least thirty years ago. I'd say even more if I just sort of think of it quickly. Probably more like thirty-five. And um. Uh, yeah, obviously I've visited before being a family member um, and uh, she lives uh, with uh, at least it's my perception that she lives with them um, two of her uh, sons who passed uh, within a few years one within a few years and one maybe a decade later um, from uh, one from I think an aneurysm um, but uh, maybe that's all a long time ago it hardly matters now but they did die young, all three of them, Mid early middle age uh, for all three of them. And um, it was regarded as quite a sad state of affairs by the rest of the family at the time. And um, they left behind, you know, some siblings. And uh, although I was certainly uh, of the view that life was uh, eternal at the time and that the afterlife was real, and uh, because my father had predeceased all of those people by uh, a number of years, and I had been in contact with him. Although I wasn't maybe quite the practitioner and facilitator 
that you uh, know now when when these uh, this happened. Um, although now that I think about it, the the uh, last uh, son of my sisters to pass in this trio of uh, passings, um, I was a, pra a practitioner by then because uh, my uh, living sister here called me up and uh, mentioned that this that he died uh, very quickly from something that looked like a heart attack or an aneurysm. And um, uh, and would I go check on him? So she knew that I did that. And when I did a meditation and projected, you know, within a few minutes of hearing this, I did find him as a ghost in his own house, uh, unaware that he'd passed very, very quickly, sitting in his, uh, you know, after, after an evening out, sitting in his favorite armchair, um, when the rest of the family had, was in bed, and I think just passed out, just went, and um, uh, I was expecting him to find finding him around the house, and he was there, and um, he he was shocked shocked to see me there. He didn't know me very well, had seen me on a vacation, um, but you know, kind of like, what are you doing here, Grim? And uh, I said, oh, I just thought, you know, so sort of, I played the game a little bit. And finally got him to uh, understand that he was dead because uh, his wife had been up and about the house and didn't, you know, seem to recognize him. Now, she must have found his body very quickly and uh, must have been very upset. And I, I don't think he initially even understood why she was upset and um, didn't, for, for whatever reason, didn't see his uh, body slumped wherever it was slumped in the chair or on the floor. And um, um, anyway, I somehow managed to uh, talk him into a more uh, realistic frame of mind and it didn't take that long. And then uh, it, s it seemed to me that a, a sort of a curtain opened up on the edge of the scene that we were in, some sort of astral version of his house. And uh, some of the other family members that had predeceased him, um, which was at least three or four, um, uh, were there and greeted him and then took him off and my, then my job was done and I came back and it was a fairly easy transition and um, they certainly was a joyful reunion for them uh, very similar to you know p they might have come to a train station or an airport to meet him the, the vibe was just the same I remember telling my sister that at the time and um, so anyway that, that, this a little interesting retrieval story from you know, early days for me as a, a practitioner. And um, although when the previous ones passed, a decade before, let's say, um, I wasn't really a conscious practitioner and more a sort of um, understanding that, uh, that life was eternal and the afterlife existed, but didn't consciously pursue retrievals or contact. So, uh, so I go and visit my sister. She's living um, in a fairly nice uh, sort of, you know, pleasant bungalow, nice garden type atmosphere, a nicer house than she ever, uh, you know, had when we was on earth. And almost everybody does have a nicer place. I mean, it's not like uh, people are going to go to a place that's shabbier than what they lived in before because um, there's lots of opportunity for... Uh, you know, uh, accommodation there. It's plenty of accommodation. Um, it's a very big place, the afterlife. There's nothing, there's no, there's no sort of squeezing in like sardines or anything like that. Uh, there's certainly no necessity for it. Some people might choose it because they like to live closely together because they did in, in their urban uh, lives and uh, got into the habit of it and uh, would miss neighbors close by. So there is that too. But it's not, doesn't necessarily have to be shabby or decrepit. And um, so, um, uh, let's see. Um, I just sort of drop in. You just sort of appear at their door or inside the house and walk right in. And they go, oh, Gordon, it's you. What are you doing here? And um, obviously I've visited before. Um, and uh, these people have... Uh, all been settled in the afterlife for quite some time and have lives that they lead. You know, they're, they're past the uh, initial shock at arrival stage. 
and um, and their lives are, I wouldn't say indistinguishable from the lives they lived on Earth, but uh, they're extensions of that. They're, they're similar. And uh, my sister seems to be uh, relaxed and quite happy, um, not up to any particular activity when I arrive, although the two sons seem to be off doing things. And, um, uh, and uh, she says, uh, uh, sort of, uh, oh, they're out right now. And... Uh, and I, I sort of accept this remark because that's the way uh, people would speak to each other about, uh, you know, family when uh, when we were young and uh, they were alive on Earth. And it's a very sort of typical sort of Scottish thing to say, oh, they're out right now, without actually saying where they are. And um, they could be socializing, they could be uh, playing sports, um, they could be doing any number of things. And um, it didn't seem important to her for her to tell me. And I, I didn't sort of you know, pep her with questions particularly, just, just a sort of general social visit. And she asked me what I was doing. And I said, well, you know, um, you know you've seen me before. I like to uh, come out of body and visit people in the afterlife. And I said, I'm asleep right now. And uh, she still seems slightly sort of surprised that I can do that. And uh, although not, it's not a completely new thought by any means, but um, and uh, she does do a little bit of traveling herself and uh, visits her uh, uh, grown daughter and her granddaughter, who are both, you know, one's middle aged, one's a young adult and, and in their lives from time to time and uh, uh, mentions that and that uh, she seems... Uh, seems reasonably happy with how their lives are going and um, seems to have no, you know, sort of criticism. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not implying that there should be criticism, but, you know, other, other um, parents and grandparents will have pointed views on how grandchildren are leading their lives if, if they feel it's appropriate. And uh, so that sort of intergenerational connection continues on. And um, mostly it's grandparents are proud of their children's accomplishments. And I think she is. And, um, um, but it's, it's a quiet pride. And, um, and I think she's very happy that uh, they've lived a longer life than she did. I think she felt a little sort of gypped by it all ending. So uh, suddenly in her early 40s. And um, I don't think she's angry about that anymore. But there's a, a sense of being, you know, life being cut short. And um, although she's accepting of it all, I, I don't get the feeling that, that she's uh, examined a life plan that she might have made before being born. And if she has, she hasn't told me about it. And, um, you know, I, I relate to her on the level that she's comfortable with. I don't sort of um, insist on other, you know, things that uh, that I've discussed here with you um, you know, that she should have experienced or done or thought about or whatever. Um, uh, the, in, in any, you know, extended family, there's people at different levels of their journey. And uh, I like to approach everyone on the level of their comfort level and try to modulate my, you know, uh, wild and crazy experiences to their uh, tastes and their, their uh, desire to reach out and, and, and share that. So um, uh, we discuss all those matters and in a friendly sort of brother sisterly kind of way. And uh, she asks how I'm doing with uh, my writing and uh, my, uh, she knows about my psychic stuff in a very basic sort of way. And I say, yes, I do that all, you know, I do it on a regular basis. I. Uh, People come to see me as a medium and I uh, uh, contact their uh, dear departed for them uh, and there's some interaction that they uh, find reassuring or, you know, uh, giving them comfort. And yes, I do do that on a fairly regular basis. And um, that sort of activity happens on a much more different level than the level we've been discussing in these episodes because... People that come to see me are usually quite distraught. 
and often will burst into tears and you know this sort of a thing which is what happens with mediums we expect that we know that, that that's that, that's part of the the game that we're playing and we you give our service to suffering humanity basically but um uh and my, my sister's always you know been interested in my activity in doing that and um asks me at some point to uh send her greetings to her uh, uh let's see daughter son grandchildren that are still on earth and i'm not really in close contact with those people so that will not be the easiest thing and they might not like uh you know saying this sort of a thing and certainly not on facebook and uh uh but uh i, I say yeah I'll, I'll do my best and i'm not quite sure how much they believe in this i think they do but again, you can't um, be, it's sort of like being, uh, you know, the one sort of church-going religious person in a family where the rest of the people aren't. You know, you don't like to be, be going to, to family get-togethers and pushing your religion on them. So um, at least I'd, I, I wouldn't. And um, it's the same with my psychic and, you know, out-of-body stuff. I don't push that on people. Quite happy to uh, relate to them on a level that they're comfortable with. So but anyway, I, I do say that uh, I'll pass along her greetings. And when the opportunity arises privately, I will try to do so. And sometimes that can take quite a while for that to happen. When you're, when you're not in any kind of regular contact with more distant family members, you know. And uh, let's see. Uh, so... Um, a general family chat and uh, I sort of explain a little bit when chat you know when uh, I'm just just uh, discussing my activities I I decide to you know, try and tell her about what I'm doing through YouTube and uh, enlightening people is, is my, or helping them in their own inner journeys and she seems pleased with that and uh, can you know uh, uh, says she's proud of me for doing such a thing and um, praises my you know sort of courage in doing it i guess to her that's an amazingly courageous thing she leads a fairly you know conventional life there and um although conventional by uh, afterlife standards is still pretty uh, wild and crazy uh, for us and um she takes one or two classes i believe and also works in some kind of retail situation and of course, retail in the afterlife doesn't involve money. There's an exchange of goods and crafts, and um, uh, people who uh, want to to get things without making them with their own mind, uh, you know, manifesting things mentally, you know, crafts, furniture, all that sort of a thing. She works in some situation, works, you know, uh, uh, and uh, she did th similar things on Earth, and she's a very sociable person and uh, enjoys helping people in uh, the, uh, the the small things of daily life and uh, she seems to have found her niche uh, for now and um, you know so I'm happy for her and um, she's come to terms with you know some of her, her children being with her there in the afterlife and some not and I know from previous visits that, that was a toughie for a while she uh, was, you know, had to deal with anger and resentment at being sort of yanked out of her life fairly quickly by the uh, the big C, cancer, and um, uh, but has has uh, in the intervening uh, quote unquote time reconciled herself to the matter and uh, is uh, quite uh, content. So anyway, I explain what I'm doing and the purpose of doing it. I says I'm kind of whizzing about visiting various people. It's kind of a visiting day. And uh, in those terms, she's quite uh, accepting. And, uh, and I give her a hug and a kiss, and then I leave. And um, where do I go next? Ah, oh, yes. Um, I, th I think about my friend David, who passed from... Uh, uh, some sort of leuke either leukemia or something very similar to leukemia a couple of years ago and I've had you know, a, a number of contacts with him since he passed include I'm pretty sure he I had a little interaction with him just a few days ago didn't I 
as we're, since we're up to number 32 now I'm, I'm uh, sort of going oh wait a minute did I visit them before or did I not um, so the whole sort of memory thing sort of comes into play there too I mean I mean I think my memory when I'm out of body is much much better than when I'm in body <clears throat> but anyway I drop in on David without any uh, warning and <clears throat> I just express a desire to see him and I find him and he's rehearsing with a band. He always was a keen amateur musician and uh, still is and it probably has expanded his abilities at this point. <clears throat> and uh, I see him uh, just uh, sort of practicing jamming with a, a group that looks about six people. Fairly sort of standard set up for a band that seems to be in the in that grey area between rock and jazz. Excuse me. And I'm I find myself standing at the back of a rehearsal room, and they're uh, plowing through a couple of numbers, <clears throat> and I, I sense without really knowing that they're getting ready for a public performance, <clears throat> and um, rehearsing in the normal way. And um, certainly, in, there I can see he's enjoying the uh, the musical interaction with his uh, friends or new friends. I'm not quite sure if they're guys he knew from years ago or all new people that he's met. I, th I think they're probably new people. <clears throat> <clears throat> and um, I just you know stand and watch and listen and enjoy. And um, my, my attention is drawn to the keyboard player. He's he's very uh, he's quite. Uh, um, adventurous, outstanding in his uh, choice of uh, chord patterns and uh, solos. And um, it's one of those numbers where like, two or three people get to solo. Uh, David uh, seems to be quite content to provide a very uh, supportive, throbbing, onward thrusting bass line with the drummer. Uh, he seems to be concentrating on that without any attempt to shine as a soloist and um, you know locking in with the drummer and creating a sort of that kind of magical forward thrust that uh, a rhythm section can create when they're um, focused you know and um, so I see myself uh, standing there and I, I, I you know he sees me at the back and smiles and I, you know, I wave and um, Um, and when they end that f number that they're working on when I arrive, um, they're, they're chatting to each other on stage about how it went. And uh, David calls out to me, hey, Gord, how are you doing? And I go, fine, how are you, Dave? And uh, uh, he says, uh, good to see you. I'll have to come and see his perform instead of just rehearse. And I think he's quite proud of what they're doing. And um, uh, I said, sure, I'll, I'll try to drop by. And uh, he just laughs. And uh, yeah, he knows my visits are, are pretty uh, improvised and random. And it's, it's probably not the easiest thing for me to, to actually make a, a specific, you know, uh, performance date. Um, that's what he thinks anyway. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I, I tend to, uh, as I say, improvise and just see what I see when I get to various locations. I mean, you'll always catch up to people if you visit them a few times especially on this sort of quick little roundabout of uh, visits. And um, I walk up to the edge of the stage and chat with them just a little bit as the, uh, the other musicians are attending to their instruments, maybe getting a retuning or something, <clears throat> and uh, have a little one minute chatter with them. And uh, he, uh, he asks me how our, our mutual friend uh, Greg is doing. And I said, oh, I met him just at the, the grocery store just, just the other evening. And um, mentioned that uh, Greg had been given a ticket to see uh, King Crimson, uh, a band that, that we, who we followed since its inception. And uh, uh, a band who are all you know, upper middle age at this point. And st still, uh, they played Toronto just uh, about a week ago and still playing with uh, great discipline and finesse. 
um, uh, I'm pleased to report. And uh, David's happy that uh, Greg got to see that. Because, as you know, a concerts are not cheap these days. And um, so we discussed that. That's, uh, you know, I'd sort of say, yeah, I wish I'd gone. I'd, I'd missed the concert completely. Um, didn't even know they were here. So, um, you know, that's the sort of thing we used to chat about on Earth a lot. We're very huge music fans. So um, that's the extent of our interaction. I say to Dave, well, listen, I'm just passing through. I've got a, a number of ports of call tonight, and um, I'll catch up to you later. And he goes, sure. And I uh, kind of give him, you know, a little uh, 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 shake on the forearm and say, we'll see you later, Dave. Have fun. And I just walk out, you know. I'm not really sure if these people are ready for me to disappear right in front of their eyes. Kind of wave at the rest of the band and say, see you guys later. And um, walk out the door of the, the building. It seems to be a sort of uh, place with a number of rehearsal rooms. Uh, and um, I guess quickly find the front door. It's a glass door and it leads out into a very pleasant street somewhere. And in a, in a community, I don't bother exploring it. I've got too much to do. And um, don't I sound just like somebody on earth? I've got too much to do. And uh, kind of whiz on to the next thing, disappear and uh, uh, execute an instantaneous transfer. And I'm trying to figure out with this consciousness that's talking to you now where I'm going. And I think the consciousness that I traveled with was in a playful mood and not uh, wanting to, uh, you know, give too much forewarning so that the consciousness here that's trying to follow would have a bit of a hard time following. My astral self can often be like that, teasing and fun loving. So I follow on and where do we wind up next? Let me get a focus here. Ah, my other recently departed friend, uh, Roger, who I did a spirit contact with. And if you go through my list of, uh, you'll see him. And I find him uh, uh, painting <coughs> in uh, a room in a house. And I'm not sure if it's his house or he's still um, hanging with his mother. Um, his mother has a fairly large house, like not a mansion, but, you know, more than more than three rooms and um isn't present but i get the sense it's her place that she set up slowly after she passed about 20 years ago with a room for her her children or her adult children should they pass <clears throat> and so roger's got, got a fairly large room that, that looks onto the garden and it's uh you know he's got you know a bed and you know chairs and tables and you know, and in, a, in one corner of the room, and it's a big corner by a window, he's uh, got his painting stuff set up. And he's, um, I think he's experimenting with 3D, 3D stuff as uh, on a smaller scale. But uh, if you check the uh, visit with Lauren Harris from a few uh, episodes ago, because as I, he, uh, I say, you know, he says, oh, Gordon, you're here. And he says, do you mind if I keep going on here? I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. And he, so I said, no, you just keep at it. I'm interested in seeing what you're doing, and I'll just watch. Words to that effect, anyway. <clears throat> and um, and he does, he, as he goes back to his painting, he, he said, I had a hunch you'd come around tonight. I don't know why, I just kind of knew. And he's saying tonight, not because it's night for him, but because he knows if I'm there, it's probably night on Earth. And I say, great, just, just keep doing it. I'm really interested to see what you're up to. And um, I stand back and watch and I'm quite content to see the, the uh, detailed forward motion of what he's, what he's uh, putting onto the canvas. And he seems to be using, you know, a brush paint palette. And uh, that's only one method over there. There's another method where you can use your mind, and I've discussed this before, and sort of point your finger at the canvas and focus with your mind and manifest the, the various uh, textures and shades that you want. And it, it appears to those watching you, because it's usually done for art class type atmospheres uh, or situations. I mean, the uh, stream of uh, colored light coming out of your finger. But anyway, he still seems very uh, uh, interested in the, the uh, brush palette paint. Looks like oils to me, but uh, I'm no expert. 
and um, I'm just watching the scene that's being created slowly and uh, it's only about half done as far as I can tell but the basic elements are there and he's uh, uh, focusing on details at the moment and I get the sense that he uh, uh, is loving the uh, I don't I think maybe superior ability on the astral plane to focus on very tiny details very very tiny details and um, he's all you know he explored various modes when I knew him as a young man he was kind of a, a sort of surrealist not a by the book surrealist but certainly a lot of surreal notions in his images and uh, and I even said to him at the time, I can remember many, you know, 40 years ago saying to him, you know, I think you're getting the, some of those details from the spirit world. And he it certainly didn't argue with me, although we didn't talk in detail about out-of-body travel particularly, but he knew what I meant. <clears throat> I remember he did a, an interesting painting from that long ago where three or four people were gathered humanoid shapes were gathered around uh chatting if you like and are seemingly interacting in an in intimate way and instead of their he you know having humanoid heads they had sort of egg shapes and uh when i you know i, th I remember saying to him i think these people are on the mental plane you know they're they're thinking you know and uh this the egg represents you know some sort of very high level of uh, thought and telepathic interaction and I mean I'm, this is a very vague memory from 40 50 years ago but uh, I remember thinking at the time that he was uh, getting inspiration from the spirit world <clears throat> and um, I mean obviously he's done tons of paintings since then and uh, I've seen some of it's on the internet and uh, some fairly conventional portraiture and landscape stuff and then uh, other highly imaginative strange looking things so obviously he explored a lot and the morning sun is now coming in through the leaves outside <laughs> it's shining right in my eyes um so uh as i look um uh, uh kind of around the edge of his body because he's standing sort of one side of the canvas and um, there's this ability to as you focus on the, the details of the image you seem it, it seem seems to retreat away from you in the in the sense of something that's two-dimensional developing depth and it, it sort of moves away like that and your eyes seem to follow it follow into it and you get a sense of three dimensions and um, this seems to happen quite naturally. Nobody's, uh, you know, uh, pressing a button or, you know, moving a switch or whatever. It seems to be a function of one's perceptive abilities. <clears throat> and uh, I, say, I, say, I say quietly to him without, you know, disturbing him. I said, I'm, I'm moving into this. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I, I hear you. I'm there. And um, so, I, you know, I look at the, the way the uh, textures and shapes elongate themselves as you have this, okay, call it illusion if you want, ability to go from 2D into 3D. And, uh, and if you pull back and don't focus, it sort of looks very much like a man standing in front of a canvas painting a, <clears throat> a two-dimensional image. So, um, I, you know, I checked that out for a few minutes and he's, he's totally preoccupied. <clears throat> and I, I explained, I said, you know, the, what I'm doing. I said, Roger, I'm, I'm doing this a little whiz about so that people can under understand how you can do a number of different things in quick succession and, and when you're out of body at night. And he goes, okay, great. And um, I said, so I'll be off now. I, I, I can see you're preoccupied and I don't want to disturb you. And he said, well, he turns around and says, um, well, come back again sometime when, when we can talk. And I said, sure thing, no problem. He says, I've got a lot to tell you. <clears throat> and um, I say, okay, we'll do so. And I disappear. Um, 
he seemed pretty hip to what I was up to. As I say, I've said in earlier contacts, he was having out of body experiences and uh, uh, things uh, for quite a few years. Uh, certainly since uh, our other friend David passed, because I, I posted that on on uh, Facebook and he saw it and we interacted over that one. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I, now I have to remember to uh, pass his greetings along to Greg, who, as I say, I ran into him at the grocery store just the other night. And the funny thing is, even though we live in the same town, I might not run into him again for months. Oh, could be a couple of months. And will I remember what Roger said? <laughs> who knows? Um, so, um, there was certainly a couple more. Can I see if I can squeeze them in? What happened after that? Um, I'm definitely editing here for the sake of time in our world. Um, so what did we go to after that? <clears throat> I'm just following on, get, trying to get focused. <clears throat> and, uh, I see Astral Gordon. Um, in a museum. There's many art museums in the spirit world. Some are astral versions of uh, 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 their counterparts on the physical plane. And uh, the great thing about astral travel is, you know, you can get to all those museums around the world that you didn't get to or can't afford to or you know, ha haven't got the time because you're too busy with other things. And it's a great place for art lovers. And uh, I'm at a place, I wonder which one it is. I think it's the astral version of the one in The Hague in Holland. And it has lots of, you know, classic Dutch paintings of which I'm very fond. And that classic era in which Jan Vermeer was one of the shining lights. And uh, also Hooch and a whole number of others. But um, I, I love that painting, and I've dropped in on this place before. And when I catch up to Astral Gordon, he's uh, looking at uh, these paintings carefully and slowly and uh, enjoying every second. And uh, as, as far as I'm concerned, here on Earth, I am a big fan of uh, Jean Vermeer's paintings. And, uh, you know, you perhaps know the story. There's only 35 of them extant in the physical plane. We're not quite sure what happened to all the others. Or was there even others? Was he busy? Because we know he was um, a married man with children and he had uh, uh, an art dealership where he bought and sold others' paintings. So he wasn't just, you know, uh, a painter. He did many other things. And it was, I think, we, we, we think he was reasonably well known in his day but his day was a day of many fine painters, and he was just one of many. And well, he still is now, but he's he's ascended to worldwide fame at this point, particularly that uh, the girl with the pearl ewing, which uh, you know is incredibly well known. And I don't I don't think it's any anywhere near his best painting, but it's the one that's that's the image that's become iconic. And. Um, but uh, I love all his work, and and these, uh, and uh, you're going to say, well, are there ones that uh, uh, got lost on the physical plane or destroyed accidentally or whatever, and um, are there on these astral plane museums? And I would say yes, there are. And um, I, I can't describe them in detail for you. That are there are some they're seen similar to the ones that you're well familiar with. The, uh, you know, there's more scenes of uh, uh, young ladies of the middle class getting their, you know, whatever their harpsichord lesson or their art lesson or whatever. Uh, and um, there's a couple more family scenes. Um, um, and I mean, I've seen these so often, I, I don't often, Astral Gordon anyway, um, doesn't, I don't think... A whole lot about what's there and what's not there. I just love what's there. And I'm sure there's other paintings elsewhere and also a whole whack of stuff that he must have created after he died. And maybe we can explore that in another uh, uh, episode. But uh, 
uh, just to show you that you can, uh, just by the whisk of a thought when you're out of body, go to astral plane museums. And um, I mean, if you just, you know, you, you, you need to focus your intention. You need to uh, say, I want to see this. I want to see that. Do you want to see Dolly? Do you want to see Turner? Do you want to see the Surrealists? Do you want to see, uh, you know, uh, Italian painting from the Renaissance? Do you want to see Caravaggio? You know, focus your intention. And you'll get to some place that's got them. And there's more than one place. Uh, there's another spirit world thing. There are um, what we would call digital copies of things all over the place. Um, so perfect renditions of famous paintings in different museums. So that, uh, but it's clearly marked. There's no no attempt at fraud. And there's it's marked, you know. Uh, on the on the plate on the back of the canvas and whatever that this is uh, they don't use the word digital but uh, you know the perfect copy and they are there you can't hard you can't tell the difference i'm not even sure art scholars could tell the difference because their method of reproduction is is finer than ours so um there's a lot of that um and uh, it's it's all agreed upon and there's no sort of fussing and fighting and you know paintings aren't worth money there they're just uh, uh, praised uh, uh, art objects, praised uh, cultural productions. I know that sounds a little drab, but I think I think you get what I'm saying. And um, so there I am in this. Um, I'm almost willing to bet it's the uh, astral uh, version of the museum in the, the town, the Hague in Holland. And uh, as I say, lots of classic Dutch paintings, including the Vermeers. And I, I derive a lot of uh, spiritual sustenance from looking at these paintings. And um, in this in this physical incarnation, when I was uh, uh, early days on my journey to consciousness, um, I I picked on uh, Vermeer's uh, painting, uh, Jesus in the House of Martha and Mary which I find, and it's also in the art gallery in Edinburgh, Scotland. And you can just, and it, I remember walking, the first time I walked up to it, having seen it in books and whatnot, was shocked at how small it was. A lot of Vermeer's paintings are small in, you know, physical dimension. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I communed with it in, in Edinburgh and it uh, certainly brought me to tears then. And um, for the sheer aesthetic beauty of it, and um, uh, the uh, Vermeer's way of capturing the human reality of the biblical story. And uh, you see a man and talking to two women and um, you get the human element of Jesus's mission out of this, out of this, this image. And um, as I, progressed on the early days of my own spiritual journey this image uh, of Jesus you know communicating uh, shall we say subtle or esoteric realities to these two women um, within his entourage um, seemed to me uh, the perfect inspiration for what I was doing or trying to do so I was very attached to that and I derived a lot of uh, inspiration from that and in, in oh I don't know the 1990s shall we say around that time and um, uh, you know we all latch on to, to some uh, inspirational moment or inspirational person or and as a, you know as I've said in other places I was influenced by a lot of different things but uh, uh, the 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 new age teachings of the 70s the the, you know, the Seth, the stuff from Findhorn, the Castaneda, a whole variety of things, a lot of theosophy. Um, but that painting by Vermeer focused a lot of it for me. And I see the sun is uh, making my face rather bright. <laughs> um, I can't really uh, avoid it. I, you know, you know, I, I'm not going to get up and pull the blinds, no. And um, so there we are. Uh, the art museum and uh, he's um, Astral Gordon who I'm sort of I seem to be looking at from a distance I'm not really in his uh, in his uh, body with him 
which is an interesting experience because it's like, oh, that's me over there. <laughs> um, so the question is, who's, uh, what actual form am I taking as I perceive Astral Gordon walking around? Because I'm, I'm not completely Astral Gordon. He's uh, an independent, in, independent being with whom I can completely identify or stand back and watch. So the question would be, who's the guy that's standing back and watching? Uh, mostly it's a projection, but still it's uh, uh, a, an interesting little puzzle, that's for sure. And that one's inner journey as, as, one, as you follow along on, on these various paths uh, pops up all kinds of interesting paradoxes like that that uh, you know, challenge you to uh, encompass them and understand them. And with that, um, he seems to have uh, whipped on to uh, uh, the uh, New Age community that's well known in Northern Scotland, uh, Findhorn. And I think he, uh, he, yeah, he's there because uh, he wants us to see all the orbs floating around. There's a lot, the whole reason for Findhorn is, uh, well, the initial reason. Um, and uh, I think they've expanded beyond that. Now it's a very well-established New Age community in which you can go and, you know, stay for a week and uh, uh, participate in the, in the gardening work and do, do study sessions on various uh, uh, things and meditate and uh, experience the group consciousness and the, the interaction between nature spirits and humans. And uh, Astral Gordon is there right now, just sort of walking around, admiring the place. And uh, hoping that, well, knowing that we'll, I'll follow along and describe uh, the, uh, there's a lot of orbs around there, what we think of as orbs. And because um, nature spirits are malleable, you know, fairies, elves, and then all those guys. Um, uh, and they can look like what we traditionally fancy them looking like. Uh, those those uh, drawings that you've seen in many fairy, fairy tale books. They can look like that, or they can look like little balls of light. And um, he's just walking around, um, not physically present, you know, there as an astral presence in a physical plane location. And um, I think, at least I think it's a physical plane location. Sometimes it's hard to tell. And um, um, we're, you know, there's other people around either walking or attending to various tasks and um, just very, very sort of uh, basic tasks, fixing things and uh, adjusting rocks and uh, moving bits of gravel around and, uh, you know, a little weeding, of course. And um, there's bits of that going along and other, other things happening, people sit, sitting, discussing uh, or seeming to be discussing. And, um, and it, there's lots of these... <laughs> floaty orbs all over the place, lots of them. And um, uh, that's the level on which I perceive them. I don't seem to see any uh, traditional looking fairies or elves or, you know, gnomes or whatever. Although I think they are, that's what we're seeing, you know. And uh, if you, maybe that's a new thought to you that uh, fairies and uh, elementals can be orbs or are actually orbs. Um, because there's, uh, you know, when people are taking the digital photographs and they're manifesting a lot of, you know, as they've been doing for the last 20 years or so, um, a lot of people feel that the orbs are not only just nature spirits, but um, representations, energetic representations of, you know, um, deceased human beings. And um, that's entirely possible too. And I neither, I neither want to uh, enter the fray on that one, but I, I do recognize the, the, that's a strong possibility. And um, but, I mean, when you look at an, uh, somebody's photograph that they've taken, and there's lots around on the net or in books, and there's some humans doing whatever they're doing, and in between them, there's masses of orbs. You know, it's hard for me to figure out, you know, who's what, although I uh, accept other people's interpretations, but I never know quite whether to, you know, agree or disagree or, you know, whatever. <clears throat> But certainly, uh, if uh, nature spirits can appear as orbs, so can uh, 
deceased human beings and also dead family pets. There's a lot of people who feel that, that the pets come around and at various social situations, children's parties, barbecues, you know, all this sort of a thing. <clears throat> um, so anyway, uh, there's Astral Gordon just enjoying walking around at Findhorn and um, just absorbing the vibe, which is, you know, they've worked at the vibe there. It's a very harmonious. And, uh, and uh, certainly if any of you feel like going, I would hardly recommend it. Going on the physical plane, I mean, but certainly going when you're out of body, just express the thought, want to go to Findhorn, and off you'll go. Conscious interaction between nature spirits and humans. Been going on there since the 70s. And uh, a pioneering uh, community for sure. And there are others that have copied the example. And um, it's all part of the uh, ongoing manifestation of, uh, as uh, Jeffrey Hodgins wrote in 1930, what uh, the Brotherhood of Angels and Men. Uh, it's, it's all part of us becoming one world and one uh, humanity, uh, with humanity including uh, elementals and angelic beings. And maybe somebody else would give another label. Maybe it's arrogant to say one humanity. Um, you, know, you know, emphasizing our form over the others. And uh, maybe there's a, you know, the brotherhood of sentient beings is maybe a better one. Because let's face it, everything is sentient. And uh, there's even the, some scientists are coming around to that. You know, that everything is conscious and everything is sentient. I've seen various articles posted on Facebook in just the last month where uh, some scientists doing some experiments have come to that conclusion. And uh, maybe we'll report on that a little farther down the line. Certainly for us mystics, we've been feeling that for a long time, that everything is conscious. Even the stuff that seems to be inorganic is conscious. And um, I'll leave you with that thought. Everything is conscious. Even the chair you're sitting in. So long.